Hello everyone, my name is Bradley. And my name's Emily. And this is SumSub, a channel about avoiding the predators lurking in the online jungle. Man began to spy on others through the keyhole pretty much the same day he invented the lock. Curiosity is an inherent part of our nature. And thanks to the development of digital technologies, spying on other people has become easier than ever before. Look here, one simple request and I can literally look into someone else's life. So obviously this is a regular Google search page, but with a little of Google's magic, and here in front of me is a list of web cameras connected to the network. See how simple it is. I mean, here's a panorama of some city, here's a classroom, and well, that's just someone's ordinary room. But you know, this hack in particular has been going on for years. I'm actually quite surprised that there are still web cameras on the network that can be found using this query. But how does it all work? In fact, it's extremely simple. In the query, I indicated that I need pages with a combination of the characters of webcam xp5 and the header. This is the same as an old program that manages webcams and in particular allows you to connect to them via a web interface. I can actually find out where these webcams are located. You see how they have external IP addresses? Well, if you search for this address through a special website, for example, dnschecker.org, then in a second, you can actually find out that this picturesque city is located in Serbia. Not bad, eh? And now, a more cool trick. If I type one more complex query into the search bar, can you guess what I'm looking for? Well, of course you can. Passwords to other people's databases. Now, in files with the env extension, some web developers actually store variables for their programs. And the most important pair of variables is the username and password for accessing the database. See, I now know how to connect to the database of some Uzbek site. And yes, I'm now a real hacker. Fortunately, not everything is so simple. To actually use this password, I'll have to somehow run my script on the same server. But this information can be the first step to really hacking the system. What I've just shown you is called Google Dork Queries. Now, these are queries that use standard Google tools to search for holes in the security systems of web resources. Search algorithms constantly scan the internet and remember pretty much everything they see. Attackers, or just curious users, only need to make the right queries in order to get access to other people's secrets. You can experiment with Google Docs yourself or use ready-made queries. For example, those that are found on my favorite site, Exploit Database. Exclusively for educational purposes, of course. But I'm gonna leave the search for holes in the security of websites for another time, for I am interested in another question. How much do all of these search engines that remember everything they see threaten living people? How much can they actually tell other people about each one of us. What can I tell you about Emily Moore? Well, first, when you were a teenager, you had the same charming smile. Here's the proof. Uh, and while we're speaking about smiles, did you know that you met Joe Biden through just two handshakes? That's right, yes, it's correct. Look, the dentist to whom you owe your smile has been working on the teeth of the future American ambassador to Ukraine for several years. I suspect you're rooting for Mercier Lynx, a youth hockey team, and one of your friends even won a bronze medal at the European Championships in this sport. Now, it probably won't surprise you that I know your phone number and even your home address too from this. And I learned all of this from open sources. So today we're gonna to talk about open source intelligence, or OSINT for short. The concept of OSINT actually appeared at the height of the Second World War. In February of 1941, President Roosevelt ordered the creation of a new intelligence unit, the Foreign Broadcast Monitoring Service. FBMS specialists had the task of listening to open broadcasts of US opponents, and through analyzing propaganda, news releases, and even ordinary broadcasts, they reconstructed the true state of the industry, infrastructure, and armed forces of the Axis countries. Initially, only $150,000 was allocated for the development of the service, but it soon proved its effectiveness. It turned out that information in open sources can tell us a lot. For example, there was a direct link between the prices of oranges in Paris and the condition of road and railway bridges. Each bombardment of these objects during the Nazi occupation of France caused problems with the delivery of tender fruits. If prices were rising, then the missions of the Allied bombers were proving successful. Lieutenant General Samuel V. Wilson, who headed up the Defense Intelligence Agency in the 70s, claims that he received 90% of intelligence data from open sources. The real heroes of intelligence were not special agents like James Bond, but rather analysts like Sherlock Holmes. 
Is it really any wonder that now we can access an incredible amount of open information via the internet? Now, it's time for you and I to master OSINT tools. Fortunately, they're now available to anyone who has an internet browser. Do you remember the video in which I was looking for the information about the viewers of the Sum Sub channel? If not, be sure to watch it later. It's a great video. But look, in it, I deliberately didn't use special search tools, limiting myself effectively to standard Google tools. Today, I'm going to take it to the next level, and I'm going to check how much information the network can actually store about a particular person. And my victim will be my co-host, Emily. And now, I'm actually going to find out the whole truth about her. So, what did I know about you before I started my investigation? Well, of course, your name. If your parents would have called you something like in the style of Elon Musk, then I wouldn't even have to try. A person with the name like X Ash A12 is pretty difficult to confuse with someone else. But you have a very common first and last name, Emily Moore. And therefore, a simple search is almost impossible to find you. You'd have to sort through tens of thousands of different people. I mean, look, here's your namesake artist. Here's an author of children's books, right? Another Emily Moore has a sensational story about voluntary organ donation. Thank God that's not you. Therefore, it's useless to search for you by name. There are just too many options. I need some kind of unique identifier. Now, we discussed our last shoot via Telegram, so I've got that. And I've also got your email, because that's where I sent your script to. And in Telegram, your nickname is M99. Now, this looks pretty much like your initials in year of birth, right? In the video about passwords, I already said that 59% of users use their real data for authorization. But in the Gmail name, use a slightly different principle, Emily Moore 74 now, the numbers in the name slightly strained me. I mean, that could be anything. The number of your room number in your student halls, the beginning or end of the home phone number, maybe the house number. The main thing is that it shouldn't be a pin code from a bank card, right? But so far, this is just a guess. Now, if I were looking for information about Emily manually, I would start with the OSINT Framework website. As you can see, this page contains links of dozens of services that help collect information about a person, site, or company based on already available data. Now, with their help, it's easy to add the portrait of any person that we're analyzing. If I already know the user's name in some social network, for instance, then the first thing I will do is check where else they're registered. None of us have had time to maintain all of our social media profiles, right? And therefore, by analyzing which networks a person spends the most time in, I can draw a conclusion about his or her interests and even evaluate their professional qualifications. For example, a profile on GitHub will be important for any programmer. If a person, and I would like to call them a victim actually, is interested in the Internet of Things, most likely they'll be registered on the IFTTT website, and a designer or a photographer might be using DeviantArt or Pinterest. And we might also find unexpected hobbies, for example, on Twitch, or information about the cities and countries they visited. Foursquare can help for that. The repeated use of the same name on different services allows anyone to come one step closer to creating your perfect physiological portrait. And therefore, if you're really worried about your privacy, try to use different names, but also don't duplicate unique information on your profiles. I mean, for instance, if you've been to the North Pole, you're fond of creating ships in bottles, and you speak English and Chinese, well, this information is more than enough to match different profiles with different names. So look, let's test this theory in practice. So I know Emily's personal email, and therefore I'm gonna check on which sites users with the same nickname were registered. So I've got two different nicknames that Emily has used. It's Emily 99 in Telegram and Emily in Gmail. In fact, this actually gives us three identifiers. Google assigns each user a hidden code. It actually consists of 20 digits. Now, it's impossible to get it directly, theoretically, but I'm gonna show you how to do it now. And Google also will help in this. Rather, Hangouts is the company's own messenger. And to find out Emily's secret ID, I'll run a search with her nickname. And then I'll open the text of the page in developer mode. Look, you see this parameter, this ID? Well, Emily is openly passed in it. For Google's internal services, your name is 11656, and so on. What does this information actually give? Well, look, I can actually see if you posted photos for Google Maps. A simple request, and alas, I see that you haven't done that. Okay, look, I'm gonna save these numbers for memory and maybe come back to them a bit later. But now, I'm gonna deal with open names. The fastest way to check them is through the site's name checker, or What's My Name. They basically check whether the entered names are available for popular internet resources. Now, already based on this data, I can say that you're right about your security. 
The name of your mailbox is not used on other sites, but you use the nickname from Telegram much more often. I actually found five matches in this case. By the way, Telegram has bots that identify phone numbers by username, but this is completely illegal, so forget I told you that. Well, look, it's a start. But now I need to study all of these matches found. I need to analyze which of them actually relate to the person I'm interested in and which do not. But also, I need to find possibly additional information here. For example, mentions of previous jobs, educational institutions, reviews of hotel rooms perhaps, and so on. Information is never and never can be superfluous. Then I would manually check the new facts. Maybe I could find out information about Emily's IP address or get GPS coordinates from the metadata of uploaded photos. I've already talked about working with this data in a video about the mistakes of famous criminals. Okay, let's take a step back here. Do you not surprise me when I actually checked your aliases? So they're not on Facebook and I can't believe you've never used them, but it's too difficult to search among a couple of billion users for a single Emily. It's gonna take much more than one week to check thousands of results. And therefore, I'm gonna try and remember which cities or companies you mentioned during the last filming session. Now you said you went to uni in Manchester. So I'm gonna try and find an Emily Moore on Facebook that is connected with the city and bingo. Among the first options, I recognized your face. And also perhaps Facebook itself played along with me as there were records in this database that we were in the same location at the same time. And this is enough to put you in the first few lines of the search results. But these are just my paranoid assumptions. Anyway, now I know another one of your online pseudonyms, emily.more.1. If your photo wasn't here, it would probably take me a long time to find it. So let's look at the profile. You hid your friends, but you made a popular mistake. Their names remain visible under the comments to your photos. So I actually got a list of two people who are definitely part of your entourage. This is Alice, the champion from Mercia Lynx, and also David Moore. David is the more secretive of them. He only has two profile pictures, and one of them has you in it. This photo was taken in 2013, when you were, assuming that you were born in 99, only 14 years old. Now, David himself is much older. I checked his picture on the website pictriev.com, and the service estimated his age at 45. That is, he should be about 55 now. He's hardly your brother, right? The age difference is too great, so I'd assume he's your father or your uncle, right? You'll be right on the money there, he's my dad. There we go. But look, what's the danger of revealing information about close relatives or friends? Well, attackers can actually use this information about loved ones for phishing attacks by effectively simulating an appeal from doctors, the police, or creating a fake profile. Facebook is generally an ideal tool for finding people. You just need to look carefully at what it shows. For example, this photo here seems absolutely harmless, right? It's unknown when and where it was taken. There are no clues in the frame, signatures or metadata. But this is not the case. I used a search for similar photos and found that God's own junkyard is a curious place just north of London. And it's also easy to look for connections between different people on Facebook. You recently wrote a review and mentioned the name of a dentist you saw a few months ago. On the Clinics page, I found not only the contact details of this very dentist, her full name is Ntela Shatirishvili, but look, the clinic has posted a slideshow in which your dentist poses with a thank you letter from Bridget Brink. Her name is easy to find on any information site. A few days ago, Joe Biden proposed her as the new US ambassador to Ukraine. A curious chain? I think not. But to be honest, I'm lazy at heart. Maybe for the first or second time in my life, such data analysis would come with great enthusiasm from my part, but for the 10th or 100th time of using it only brings me boredom. Therefore, I'm gonna suggest that you dig into the possibilities of open resources yourself, and I myself will opt for a more serious tool. And here, you can't make do with just one browser. So I installed Maltego. Now this is a powerful software package that has long been in the arsenal of any professional hacker. For example, in Kali Linux, it is immediately included in the distribution. Now today I'm using Windows computer, so I'll have to download it from the website of the same name. You'll actually find a link to it in the description of this video. I don't want to spend extra money on this entertainment yet, so I'm going to use the free version of the program for this example. Community Edition is limited in search depth, and as a rule, it gives only the most popular answers to the query I'm interested in. The number of objects in it is limited to 10,000, and of course, it cannot be used for commercial purposes. But for the first time using the software, Multigo CE is quite a suitable option. Now, if we are to draw an analogy with the real world, Multigo is most like a board with the results of an investigation 
information from a cool detective, right? We'll be able to place the collected evidence on the main work screen, and the program will help us to build connections between them. For example, for a specific person, these may be profiles in social networks, highlighted phone numbers and email addresses, maybe even articles with mentions to them on the internet, and so on. By the way, do you remember I said that Bitcoin is not anonymous in a previous video? But look, here, even in the basic version of the program, several modules are available for analyzing payments and building chains of connections between different crypto wallets. But let's return for a minute to the search for information about a particular person. Some of the services in the free version are available with restrictions, and some require additional authorization and obtaining a key from the project's partners. Multigo is effectively a meta shell that allows you to automate routine information retrieval processes. But we're going to have to think in exactly the same way as we would if we were analyzing through the ONSIT framework. Now, let's see what the protagonist of our video thinks about my investigation. What was I right about? Where did I make mistakes? And where did I miss important details? Oh, um, what about you, your name? Is there any, any reasons why your parents called you Emily? Perhaps if you'd been able to find a little bit of information about my mum, you would know that she is a teacher. Um, and her biggest challenge when choosing my name was picking a name that she hadn't had a child she had already taught and grown to passionately dislike. So she chose Emily because she'd never taught any Emilys and therefore she still liked the name. Even the part about your friend winning a bronze medal? Yeah, my oldest friend is a semi-professional hockey player. Wow, and did you know that you know Joe Biden through just two handshakes? Not at all. Was I right about the Manchester thing? You're right, I did go to uni in Manchester, but I'm not from Manchester originally. Um, I'm glad to see you weren't able to find my birthplace anywhere on the internet yet. But did you know that your uh, dentist was actually a sort of big shot dentist? No, I didn't. She's a great dentist, but I knew nothing about her other clients. So look, so we, we actually know more about you than you know about you, which is <laughs> kind of crazy. Quite scary. So what's God's own junkyard like? Pretty cool. It's a nice free place that you can uh, spend a bit of time in London. So, can you buy drinks there, or is it like a restaurant, or what is it? They might have a coffee shop. I don't know. I was just there for the pictures. Cool, nice one. And um, I noticed that clinic was actually in Georgia. So I've got a quick question. What were you doing in Georgia? Um, I was taking a working holiday. I spent a month in Georgia, but back in London now. So I suppose the biggest question here is: Were you surprised by the amount of information we could dig up just from open sources? Yeah, I absolutely was. Things like my dad, maybe I'm not that surprised about, but more, more details about my friends, what they do, my dentist, for example, um, shows I'm leaving a much larger online footprint than I realized. Well, look, the interface of this program does need some getting used to. We need to bear in mind that this is a professional behind the curtain kind of tool, but I really plan to master it. These modules are undeniably intriguing, and I want to know what kind of power they're actually hiding, and whether or not they're worth the money. And therefore, I plan to practice OSINT investigations on my colleagues, and then I'll return to this topic with new knowledge about the features of the paid version. Guys from Paterva, if you're watching this video, bear that in mind. Once again, I've been convinced that there is information about pretty much everything on the internet, and if you just can't find something, well, you don't know how to search for it. In any case, my name is Bradley. And my name's Emily. And this is SumSub. And also, if you want some fancy alliteration from us, you better squeeze it out of me using OSINT. And I will see you in the next video.